Professor Luca Brown, who is the academic director of the Yesu Business School in New York. We heard yesterday from Carlos Cavalier about the outreach of Yesu here. And uh, so Lou is in New York, and he's on leave from New York University. We clearly don't want to lose him. And the title of his talk is Are the Laws of Economics Compatible with Free Will? Thank you, John. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I apologize for I'm still coming out at a cold. Um, I feel very much like sort of the uh, child in a candy store in here, I'm really enjoying uh, learning about all of these uh, interesting topics. I also feel very much like an outsider because I, I'm more like a consumer in here than a contributor. Nevertheless, I think being an outsider, sometimes it's useful because it kind of brings you a sort of a different perspective on, on things that you're probably very uh, familiar with that I was not very familiar with. Uh, and so I'll talk about what I know, which is economics and how it relates to some of the issues we've been uh, discussing here um, in three basic points. Uh, they all relate to economics, even though it may not seem. One, um, uh, the importance of the law of large numbers in economics and in discussion of the relation between determinism and free will. Second, the whole field of neuroeconomics, which is basically the application of neuroscience to economics. It's a very relatively recent and very exciting field. I, I thought I would talk a little bit about that. And thirdly, the issue, from an economics point of view, of the relation between free will and predictability, uh, which, of course, in economics or well, in science more generally is, uh, is a very important issue. Um, now, I have to start with a little bit of history. So economics did have its Laplace moment, too. So in the 19th century, uh, this economist who actually made some interesting contributions to economics, uh, Francis uh, Edgeworth, uh, he wrote about the idea of creating a a donimeter, um, or uh, the idea of, of measuring uh, the satisfaction that individuals have, or utility, to use the economics uh, terminology, the utility that people have in making various economics choices. But of course, he didn't have the technology to do so. But the idea was that you know economics is essentially a deterministic science, and if you can measure things well enough, then we'll be able to solve all the problems. In fact, the idea of economics as sort of the uh, the queen of social sciences also comes from this as being sort of queen of behavioral science, that if you can do this, all choices that are made by humans are pretty much predetermined by things that we now cannot measure, but one day we can measure. So that was a program. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending how you want to see it, there were no MRIs in the 19th century, so this didn't go very far back then. And so classical economics for the past uh, a century or so, which of course in physics time is the past several centuries, has been mostly a deductive effort. You know, because induction is very difficult in trying to understand economics as a behavioral science. And, and what is that model? I thought I would, many of you may not be very familiar with it. It's a very simple model. It's a model where individuals have, are uh, endowed, the homo economics basically is in doubt with a set of preferences, which is a complete ordering over all the possible alternatives. So it's you know reflexive, transitive, anti-symmetric. And the model of the homo economics is a model where there's a deliberative choice between these alternatives, which chooses the best one in each situation, considering the subset of alternatives that I have. So it, it's a very deterministic model. Um, it's not one that economists spend a lot of time thinking about in terms of philosophical foundations, but that's one that's used. And the, the deductive uh, uh, effort of, of economists has been mostly to try to see what are the implications of that, and, and, uh, and then two important results, which may seem trivial, but they're actually not trivial. They're actually uh, quite challenging. First one is that this complete ordering is essentially equivalent to uh, postulating a utility function a function that gives you a level of satisfaction, if you will, of each alternative, and the idea that you choose the maximum utility you can in each particular moment. And the second one, that if I can observe people's choices in actual choice states, I would be able to back out not only the complete ordering, but also, therefore, that utility function uniquely up to a linear transformation. Of course, this is an approximate estimation. It would be exact if I had an infinite number of observations that would be uh, independent from each other. So that's what economists have been working on for, for decades. Um, with not much thought as to what that original basic model really means, this is just a model that seems to work fairly well in a lot of different uh, settings. Uh, how do we then deal with data? Even though it's mostly a deductive effort, we do at some point have to deal with data. And so the way you do it, 
you know, because of the results that I just mentioned earlier, it just posits that there is some sort of a utility function, which is the utility of alternative i given observable characteristics of that individual, d, plus epsilon. So the whole philosophical point today is about epsilon. But this is basically the model that we will be using. <coughs> And of course, in terms of, for a practical point of view, the dual interpretation of that is that if you're looking at one single individual, uh, you're just going to give probabilities of choice, which you may interpret in different ways. But at the aggregate level, and this is probably a trivial point for most of you, it really doesn't matter because, you know, by the law of large numbers, this is going to be an approximately, not exact, but in theory would be an exact uh, uh, set of, of, of relations that it would have. Um, because all of the epsilons will, 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 will cancel out if they're independent across individuals, which is, so would be the assumption that would be made. And so this is basically the way that we usually work, which I think, I hope this is correct, it's, it's, the analogy in here would be the relation between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics. I mean, you're you know, a mechanical engineer or you're a civil engineer, of course, they take a course in quantum mechanics in, in, in university. They may even get a very good grade at it, but they soon forget about it because, you know, for your daily life, it really doesn't matter, you know, F equals M times A, and I don't care whether there's quantum uncertainty or not. I may be wrong about that, but that's the perception at least that I have, that for, from a practical point of view, in other words, uh, the models that you use of, of classical mechanics, they just work, and, and they're somewhat independent of the foundations of whether there's randomness, free will, whether there's no randomness at all, or whatever. And in economics, a similar thing is happening uh, because just basically the way we look at large, large numbers, and that's what economics laws are. They're laws of aggregation, essentially. It really doesn't matter a lot what is the uh, foundational model of choice and what that epsilon is about. Or maybe it does. That's what I want to go next, which is um, in comes neuroscience into economics. And so, um, what, what I want to do is, it, it, well, basically the idea is just to measure brain activity in economics choices. What I mean by economics choices is situations when you have several alternatives, there are deliberate alternatives, so we're not talking about flexing your hand or, or, or anything like that, we're talking about what are supposed to be deliberative choices amongst uh, uh, several alternatives. And so just to uh, measure brain activity and try to learn something from it. Okay. Um, my next slide, you know, I'm going to so preface it by saying that, as you probably know, 37.3% of all statistics are made up. <laughs> and so, <laughs> what has the profession's reaction been to this sort of thing? I'd say that 5% of the people uh, would tell you that, you know, like a mechanical engineer would talk about quantum mechanics. Listen, our model, the economics model, is axiomatic. So as long as you believe, you know, all you have to do is say, from these axioms follow these results. And they kind of seem to work fairly well with reality. So it's fine for you to study that. I just don't care. I mean, it's just, it's an independent field of study. So that's one possible reaction. And you have maybe 5% of you will say that. 5%, probably, probably even more, there are true Laplacians. There are Laplacians in economics. People who truly believe that epsilon is measurement error, pure measurement error. <laughs> that, you know, uh, one day we'll be able to perfectly predict your behavior when faced with several alternatives. And, and there's a lot of, by the way, very cheap neuro quote unquote science in here, especially people in marketing who are kind of try to sell their services as, uh, you know, we'll be able to sell more if, if, if only I can measure, but we can talk more about that later. 85% of people don't even think about this. This is just the truth. Uh, and in fact, you know, if I were to say that I would, I would be writing on this, people would just have a frown of, of surprise. Not a disapproval, but mostly a surprise. You know, why is that important? Uh, and finally, this is where I am. I actually think that neuroscience can be very helpful in trying to understand a lot of things. Because eco the classical economics model, just like classical mechanics, work very well within a certain environment. And the moment you start pushing the boundaries, it starts shaking a little bit, just like classical mechanics do. Even in terms of when things start moving very fast or when things are very microscopic, things are start shaking. The same thing happens in economics. The model actually works fairly well for a lot of different settings, but then there are settings when it doesn't. So I'm going to give you an example of that and how <coughs> neuroscience can be helpful. It's the issue of time preference. It's one of the areas where economists have had a harder time explaining behavior. So here's a very simple ex uh, example of choices. One, you're going to choose between $10 today and $20 tomorrow. 
case two, you're going to choose between $10 tomorrow and $20 the day after tomorrow. If you believe in classical economics, your choice has to be the same in these two situations. Why? Because the model of homo economics is that there's one self which is the same today and tomorrow. If I think rationally about it, tomorrow, the decision I'll have to make tomorrow is isomorphic to the decision I'm making today. So I should basically have the same decision between A and B. Of course, different people have different preferences. Some want money faster than others. That's fine. <laughs> I'm one of them. But you should be consistent in case one and case two. If you prefer A in case one, you should prefer A in case two. Now, the empirical evidence overwhelmingly rejects this. People overwhelm, in terms of the proportion, the proportion of people who choose A in case one is much higher than in case B. So that's a violation of classical economics. In other words, in, in more technical terms, time discounting has to be exponential in classical economics. It's the only function that preserves uh, uh, the, the same uh, ordering of choices over time as it should according to the classical model. But empirically, the function that best fits the way people deal with time is uh, hyperbolical discounting, which um, puts a huge discount into the future. In other words, the future is discounted much more heavily than exponential discounting would, would predict. And so, um, what you do with that, the way economists have dealt with before in neuroscience is basically, let's try to patch up the model in some way. Uh, a bit like, you know, classical mechanics or uh, Newtonian physics might, when it, you know, you start getting into trouble with things. And one model that's become very popular is the model of mutual selves that the homo economics is actually several selves over time. That myself today is a different self than myself tomorrow. And that we're in inner conflict in our decisions. That my best interest today may not be my best interest tonight, tomorrow as measured by today. Maybe. I mean, it certainly is a way of solving it because you're reducing degrees of freedom in here, of course. Uh, uh, it's almost like tautological. But that's become a very popular model of why people uh, over time behave in this, in this manner. And so this is a problem that, that uh, uh, neuroscientists have, have tried to tackle. Paul Glimcher at NYU has a lab on that. He's one of the uh, few labs in the US that are truly pushing this program in economics, of neuroscience in economics. <clears throat> His results from this experiment, so basically he has not only these two, but many other cases so that he can have enough varia variation to, to measure things better. And then he measures brain activity. And the outcome of that, uh, in, in a nutshell, is that a, the brain areas that are activated in the choices are always the same. There's really no statistical difference in terms of brain areas that are activated. And B, the uh, level of brain activity is surprisingly correlated to the implicit level of utility that's measured. Let me explain what I mean by estimated utility. I mean that if I give you several options, you know, 10 plus 20 or 20, then 10 and 15, 10 and 25, if I give you a lot of options, eventually I will estimate, I'll be able to estimate what is the level at which you would be indifferent. Different people will have different levels of indifference. In some cases, I need $15 tomorrow to be indifferent with respect to 10 today. Some people need 50, some need, yeah. So I will be able to estimate that. That estimate of level of, 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 of how much kick I get of $20 tomorrow versus $10 today turns out to be surprisingly well correlated to brain activity in here. <clears throat> so. What do you make of this? I don't know, I'm not sure, but at least it seems to be a, 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 a shed some light on this model of mutual selves. At least that's the way Glimcher is reading it. If truly there would be a model of mutual selves, you would expect there would be two different brain functions that would correspond to myself today and myself in the future. Would be, I would be thinking differently, as it were. Well, today it shows that, no, you're not thinking differently. You're just not discounting exponentially. So you need to have a different patch in the model, probably different from this multiple selves model. Personally, I have my explanation for that, but since I probably don't have a lot of time, I'll probably leave that for, for later. So third and last point that I want to make, um, again, looking at things from, I don't know sure exactly what this means for our present discussion, but um, from an economics point of view, what is the relation between free will and predictability? Because after all, it's a common complaint that I get when people talk about it. I mean, 
economics is not even a social science. I mean, it's just a social endeavor. I mean, it cannot be a science because it has absolutely no predictable power. And, and that's the hallmark of science. It's predict it's you can replicate something, you have to predict something, and so forth. Therefore, since, I mean, especially just look at the events in the past few years, you know, and it's a, a flat failure to predict any sort of events. So how can you even, uh, I want to think of it as, 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 as a, some sort of a, a science, even if just a social science. It's a very common complaint. And the reason people then would add, you know, the reason why that's happening is that in economics we have free will, whereas in science you don't have free will. That's a very common, very common position that a lot of people have, both within and outside of economics. And I would out, like to argue that that's actually wrong, and I would like to hear your opinion about that. And my claim is that the main source of unpredictability in economics is complexity, not free will. Both of them are important, actually, but I think uh, um, uh, complexity is much more important. And I would argue that something is also true in, in other fields of, of, of uh, non-behavioral science. And so here's you have my, you know, my very simplified table where you have models that can be simple or complex, and, and the behavior that you're st uh, studying, uh, so the phenomenon you're studying can be behavioral or non-behavioral. And, you know, from non-behavioral... Five minutes. Uh, five minutes Thank you. Um, <coughs> I think I'll be fine. So, um, my point is that the, the um, uh, um, loss in degree of <coughs> prediction is much faster going this way than going down this way. I have here some examples of what would be typical examples of what I have in mind. I don't know enough about the study of animal behavior to try to say what is a simple model, what is a complex model, so I would need probably your help. But at the level of non-behavioral science, I would say this is a lab experiment, you know, the typical classical mechanics experiment or quantum mechanics experiment, <coughs> if you will. Um, no, not, let me forget about quantum mechanics, classical mechanics experiment. And a complex model, you can think of weather, climate, or turbulence, <coughs> or in thermodynamics. I mean, it, you can think of and you know surely better examples than I do of models that are complex in, in the uh, <coughs> mathematical uh, sense of the word. For economics, I mean, just to give you two examples, uh, in the paper that I distributed, a very simple paper, I talk about car purchases because that was one of the areas where I think um, economics has made the most progress in trying to deal with data. Mm -hmm. and, and the aggregate uh, predictions of behavior, the, the predictions of aggregate behavior in things like uh, um, automobile purchase behavior, it's actually remarkably good. It's very good. Um, you look at changes in demographics, what happens if, if this population has family size increases by this much, or if price varies by that much. Um, we, are able to, you know, we are able to do actually a pretty good job in, term, in, in terms of trying to predict uh, variations in, in, in uh, how many people will buy the, the blue car, the red car, or the green car. Uh, but usually people only think about economics in this term, you know, the global economy. Of course, I mean, the global economy is a global, you know, it's a system as complex as weather, probably even much more complex. So why should you, um, why should you expect greater predictability, sorry, um, greater predictability in here than you do in here? You should be comparing this to that. And, 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 and it's one of the uh, current uh, common economist jokes is that the reason why God created uh, a meteorologist was that so economists it wouldn't look so bad. And, <laughs> and there's some truth to that. I mean, in that sense, it's not very different. So, I, you know, I believe in, 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 in free will and all that, but I actually think from a practical point of view, and with it, I close as, as a classical uh, uh, um, um, mechanics kind of person, it actually doesn't matter that much. Um, uh, and theoretically, as I wrote in paper, I think that free will and, and from an, econ an economist's point of view, and that's what, what most people will tell you, uh, randomness and predictability and free will are observably equivalent from the point of view for, for the purposes that we're working on every day, which is aggregate behavior. So it really, really doesn't matter that much. Um, so I think this is pretty much all that I have to say. Thank you. Thank you.